uh, 3 this morning, if you want to turn there. We're going through the book of Ephesians verse by verse, so you understand so every now and then I'll do a little review to keep things in context. The Apostle Paul is essentially, this is more of a, he's writing uh, from a prison in Rome. You have to understand that. He's calling himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ, not of Rome or of Caesar, but of Jesus. So that's your perspective. We're, we're never, men are never in control of their lives. God is. No matter what happens, you have to know that. And it brings great security into life. And it's a circular, circular letter. It's not just going to the church at Ephesus there in Asia Minor, but it's being circulated around the churches in that area. So it'll give a little bit more of a feel for the overflow coming from Paul. He hits this doxology. He just overflows with the Koine Greek. He's the master of the Koine Greek, one of the brightest minds that ever lived, some of the greatest literature that's ever been written, and yet he breaks grammar because uh, language does not serve uh, uh, correctly what Paul is feeling. He's going to use words in the Greek that are almost like supercalifragilistic expialidocious, <laughs> you know, describing what we have in Jesus Christ. And so, with that in mind, let's take a look at this in Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, he says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he has made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written, uh, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. This is mysterion in the Greek. It's something that was previously hidden but is now revealed by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles, and here's the mystery, that the Gentiles shall be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power to me, and this is where he gets into the supercalifragilistic expialidocious, to me who is less than the least of the saints. And it's kind of like a man saying, I am less than the less of the least of the little of the miniature, miniature, and he goes on and on and on. He's just trying to, what he's saying is, is that language is to serve man, man is not to serve language. I will break protocol with, with and literary skill to try and stretch the limits of the imagination and the pathos and the emo emotions of what I'm feeling that I have, that Christ himself, that God himself dwells in me, and he's taking me to glory, me, animated dust. You know, the, you're made of the same elements that, that makes up dust. That's no coincidence. <laughs> It, it rings true in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that you were made from the dust of the earth. You see, but here he says, uh, to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentile the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from, uh, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in Christ who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold or the many colored wisdom like a kaleidoscope the many colored wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in our Lord Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through him and faith. Therefore I ask you that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his strength, uh, his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with the, with the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness, fullness of God that comprehend, he says, by the strengthening power of God, the Holy Spirit in you, that you have all of God Almighty in you. 
and that the sensation is latent with you, but the very fact that you come and pour out your hearts and worship him is proof that God is latent in your life and he will come to the surface every now and then. And the more you grasp that, the more you understand that the fullness of God is in you to him. Be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I almost don't want to preach on this because I'd mess it up. It's so powerful in and of itself. It's like biting into a jalapeno uh, pepper, you know, and your mouth just has a party in it. That was a bad uh, simile. Let's just move on here. But look what he says. He starts off and he goes, who am I? I used to kill Christians. I persecuted them. I was a terrorist. I used to throw them in jail that I should preach to the Gentiles. These unspeakable riches that God has given us of Paul, this master of the Greek here. I'm less than the least. And what we see here is Paul is demonstrating what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 4, 23, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. Heart is power. A full heart has energy. It has enthusiasm to it. Enthusiasm means full of God. Full heartedness has tremendous force behind it. And we see this in Paul. We see it in Jesus Christ. Say, you, listen, you live half-heartedly. You live without any real convictions in your life, and you will become food for people who are full-hearted, whether they're in error or not. Hitler was full-hearted. Stalin was full-hearted. You you, but you can see the power behind a full heart, even as tragic as its misunderstanding of reality is, there's a power to it. And so here Paul is breaking the rules of grammar and just saying, I am the less, the, the less than the least of the saints. And so a proper estimation of Paul's self puts you and I above Paul. Paul is saying, You're, I'm the least of all of you. You are above me. And that brings humility into the church. It brings unity into the church when we esteem one another more highly than ourselves, you see. And, and, and remember, Paul's talking to people he has to cor frequently correct. He has to correct them for the worst behavior, but he says, I'm less than you. He's not exaggerating. He's not given to uh, unnecessary hyperbole. He sees himself as the most forgiven person on the planet. And you all are above me, he's saying, you see. And, but, but listen, he knows that you and I, as much as we are in our immaturity and selfishness, whatever stage we are, God has his heart set on us. You're the, you're the body of Christ. You're, you're the bride of Christ. He elected you. He bled to death to own you and never put down God's bride, including yourself because his heart is totally full towards you. And so Paul looks at his ministry as a gift from God, a high, high honor. And I'll tell you what, it is the highest honor a man can have on the planet. This pulpit, every pulpit, should be a throne from which God's glory is dispensed out to his people. You know, and I'm not knocking skinny little podiums, but I think that there's a reason sometimes when you see a big, majestic pulpit with a big fat guy behind it and and you, you know there's there's you're, and it's up and it's coming from the throne of God and it's the many colored wisdom of God blessing God's people at various stages in their growth you see and so Paul looks at this as, as this great honor and so <clears throat> and what he will emphasize over and over again is is the glory of the person of Jesus Christ and though he was glory incarnate, don't we see that his glory shone through the veil of his flesh on the Mount of Transfiguration? It's like it couldn't contain that glory for, for a moment there. We saw that the waves kissed his feet, that the winds fell silent, the grave couldn't hold him down, that he who restrains the universe by the word of his power veils himself in flesh to redeem selfish men, to redeem rebellious dust. But today he has put aside the serving towel that he used to wipe the feet of the apostles, and now he rules from heaven with all authority and power. This mighty God, this heroic God, this everlasting Father whose government is upon his shoulders. Sound familiar to, the, to you from around Christmas time? That's from Isaiah. the 
throne of God, the pulpit of God, rules the heart of men more gloriously than any king. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. How much did God love this world? So loved the world. Can't even describe it. How much? He stretches out his hands on a cross and bleeds to death. Immorality bleeds between heaven and immortality bleeds between heaven and earth. The words fail. The word of God failed words. Jesus Christ, the word of God failed words to accurately describe his love. The breadth, the height, the width, the depth. How do you comprehend this love? It's a foreign love, it's an alien love, and, and we see that all things are brought together into Christ, Jew, Gentile, black, white, conservative, liberal. The one main thing about this world is that everything is falling apart. Just turn on the news. Societies, families, war, disease, death. And God calls you and I to put his many colored love and wisdom on display to all the peoples of the world and all of the angelic realm. We know from the Bible that angels rule certain areas. There are demonic angels, fallen angels. There are uh, angels like Michael who are uh, over Israel, we're told in the book of Daniel. They're real. This is real. And I think the demonic creature over Baltimore has a crab mallet in one hand and a Coke spoon in another. You don't know what you're dealing with. There are certain things that drive the culture. We're told we're being driven along till we know Jesus Christ by the poison and the water of the culture. And people are living unaware of these things. And we're told here that the angels learn the deepest things of God by observing his dealings with us. And so we're his masterpiece. And God's canvas is huge. It's the size of the universe, and he paints with endless colors and hues. And it's a picture called history, with the central drama uh, being salvation to display this gift of God, the complex, intricate wisdom of God that angels saw. Let's think about this. Angels saw creation. They sang. They freaked out. It was an amazing thing. They saw Adam. They saw Noah. They saw Abraham and Moses. You know, they saw rivers of blood flow from the altars, symbolizing the death of an innocent substitute, an innocent animal, you see. And, but they had to wait for the church, you and me, to understand the deepest part of God, how he deals with us, how he dealt with you and you and you and you and you, how he took you from... From, from dust, and he's taking you into glory. And so we become uh, this museum that angels visit with ever-increasing delight and wisdom and learning about God. They're probably here right now learning about God through what he's doing in your life. This is Bible doctrine. This is not legend. This is not myth. And the angels saw God create creatures that were half not half, but part spirit and part material, and then give them the honor of being made in the image of God himself. And then they failed, and then they were restored, and the angels are just what? The angels watched in astonishment as the king of glory rose from his throne 2,000 years ago, shed his glory, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but, but it shed that glory, laid it aside, came into a manger as a, as a baby, dependent upon his mother, born to die to save his rebellious subjects. Any two-year-old can wear a crown. Take him to Burger King. But our God... His royalty is measured by the giving of himself, a king who serves the unworthy subjects. I want to be like him. The more you know him, the more you want to be like them. And do you know that that is an extension of the healing power of Jesus Christ into this world? 
that it deals with racism and it deals with wars and it deals with the divorce and all of these things here. God giving divine status to man who fell so bad, who was given so much mercy. He does not give that status in a vacuum like he did to angels. The angels fell, they rebelled, they were not forgiven, but we've been forgiven and now for eternity. It appears we never will even have a rebellious thought because we know we know who we are. And we will sing of the cross onward and onward, and it gets brighter and brighter and newer and newer. And it's an amazing thing that we have inherited from God. And the wisdom of the cross outmatched all the subtlety of hell. There is more wonder in the church to look at than all of creation. You know, angels never sing amazing grace, how sweet it is. That God would save a wretch like me, they were never forgiven. The ones that fell were never forgiven. We will sing that song, we do sing that song. And there's not one wasted stroke in our lives so that the world will say God is infinitely wise, so that angels and demons will say, so the same, say the same. And Paul is writing this from prison to say, let me tell you something, knowing Jesus Christ is way more valuable than your freedom. Knowing Jesus Christ is way more valuable than your reputation, than friendship, than anything else. I am overflowing with joy and gratitude in prison. And prison in those days was no picnic. I know because I was there. And, uh, but here these angels are amazed at the way God rolled the stone away from mankind's grave. Amazed at the wisdom of giving himself as a substitute for man's guilt. And every child of God in this room was spit upon in him and rejected in him and tortured in him and persecuted in him and bled to death in him. He became our substitute. He was punished for our guilt, for our rejection of God. And so here we see the cosmic church, that we belong to the family that will never end. You see, the church, the church, the people of God, the ecclesia. We have cosmic significance. We are to have the aroma of God about us. Listen, Jesus knew every part of his life was a plan of God. And you're to know the same thing. Never despise what happens in your life. Jesus knew he was part of a cosmic plan. Listen, you and I are not only the light of this world. <clears throat> we are the light of the cosmos because we're told that the glory of God through us somehow will fill the universe. You're not just the light of the world. You're the light of the universe. Beam me up, Scotty. It, 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 try and wrap your head around what we're being promised here. That's why the master of the Greek is like uh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. I'm just, I'm blown away from this. You know, so he says, we're going to reveal this wisdom to supernatural beings, both evil and good. Let me tell you something here. Satanic forces have gotten a hold of every invention of mankind and twisted it, and polluted it, and made it an ugly thing. You know, man comes up with a way to deal with pain through opiates and different things, and then of course Satan turns it into addiction. We come up with nuclear energy and Satan turns it into a, a massive killing machine. We get petroleum and greed comes in and oppresses people and there's international blackmail. And you see all of these things, anything to destroy man. We see universities pop up and claim to proclaim uh, wisdom above that which is normal in the society, and they just use it to, with some perverse scheme or some bizarre ideo ideology or, or, or that the communism is now becoming very popular on the co college campuses today. And you see a people who, who have somehow forgotten or never knew history that all communism ever did was oppress people. You know, it takes people, it, it makes everybody poor. <laughs> Not just some rich and some poor, eventually makes everybody poor. What 
is that? What is it? Amber Alert. Jesus is coming back. <laughs> John Van Lubin, resident mental case. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, believe in demons. <laughs> you wouldn't see what you see on the news if they weren't around, let me tell you. Mankind is evil, but Satan knows how to kick it up, you see. And we're headed for a family reunion. We're going to see all the people that we left. We're connected with saints above. We're connected with, with the saints in China. Think about it. Thought is faster than the speed of light. And thought can go anywhere. Faster than the speed of light. God is bigger than space itself because Solomon said the heavens and the heavens of the heavens can't contain God. They came from God. And somehow he fills it all with his glory. And so, you know, here spirits defy space. They annihilate distance. And, you know, our, our influence in Christ, listen, your influence in Jesus Christ is going to go further. It's going to go further than your life existence through your children, your grandchildren, and all the people that you influence, all the people you never even know that are watching you, you see. And so what he's saying is this, I have to strengthen you because there is so much involved. Remember when Jesus said to the disciples at the Last Supper, he said, I have a lot of things I want to tell you, but I can't tell you everything because you can't handle it right now. God's got a lot of things to tell you and show you uh, to learn about himself, but you, you're, you're not ready right now. I know because I've been doing this for 32 years or so, and half the stuff I teach today, I wasn't ready for 20 years ago. I couldn't comprehend it. I couldn't digest it properly. It takes time. And God, and we, we're all here at different levels here. Don't be surprised when Christians act immature. We're all at different growths. You know, a baby poops its pants. You, you've got to expect messes, you know? When you're 30 and you're pooping your pants, that's a, that's a problem. You see, but, but, but he, don't be surprised. Give grace. We act stupid. I, I think sometimes the first several years of, of your Christian walk, you tend to get very legalistic. And that can be really obnoxious, but you have to be patient with that. And, and yes, I'm perfect, but there was a time. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? You have to be ready. You have to be prepared. You, you know, and so whether the breadth of God is God so loved the world that whoever I will draw all men unto myself, or whether the length is he loved you before time and will never lead you nor forsake you, or whether the depth of God is he went down to the depths of hell, in a, in a sense experiencing it, those three uh, those hours on the cross, or whether it's the height, whether it's I'm seating you with Christ in heavenly places, whatever that may be, Philippians chapter Chapter 2 says that he who was God didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but divested himself of his glory, came to the earth and died. The complete opposite of man who said, well, uh, even though I'm not God, I'm going to rob the title of God. <laughs> That's what Adam did. See, there's all these contrasts and comparisons here. You know, whatever that may be, he says, just try to be soaked in this. Like a mint, you just kind of nurse it and, and keep the flavor going. You know, when you leave here, it's a, there was a, uh, somebody was telling me one time he had a friend who was, who was the owner of a, a pretty fancy restaurant in New York City, and no matter how hard times got, and the, when they have to skimp on certain things, the one thing they wouldn't skimp on was the coffee. And the reason he said we did that was because it's the last thing they remembered about a meal here. And I want you to, this to be your, your, your cup of coffee before you go into the week. And, and, and sensationalize the taste buds and let it come in. Let the flavor affect your soul and, the, and the, 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 every layer of who you are. You're a child of God and you're a masterpiece and you're a work in progress. And don't despise God's timing with people. Be patient with one another because that's all part of the unity of the church being patient and mature and, and esteeming others is better than yourself. Don't come in here and try and be a big shot. You'll destroy everything good in your life and everybody else's life. J.I. Packer said this, that meditation is often reasoning with yourself and arguing yourself out of doubts and moods of unbelief into a clear apprehension of God's power and grace. 
And so what God does here, what Paul does by the Holy Spirit is he spreads the riches of God's grace out before us and then the Holy Spirit spotlights what we have. And what he's saying here is, I will increase your capacity to understand God. I will increase it as you go on life, but I can only give it as I have prepared you to receive it. And so don't be frustrated with God's pace in your life. So he talks about heaven's geometry, the length of God, the love of God, the breadth of the love of God, the width of the love of God, the height of the love of God. He said, I want God to strengthen. I'm praying God strengthens your your mind and your heart to comprehend, to realize, to make real, vivid to your heart these things. You see? That we have given our souls, we have given our souls to a king who has entered into our suffering and worn his own blood as a robe. We have washed our hands in the blood of our best friend, our God, our King, our Lord, our glory. And he says this, angels, is what I'm about. This beats creation, doesn't it? This is more fascinating. This church here is more fascinating than creation, than waterfalls and lightning bolts, you see? And we're told by Paul that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world. What, what world? There was nothing lovable. It was a spiritual wasteland covered in thorns and thistles. It was a place where man hated God and hated one another. The first brothers, one killed the other. First man in heaven was, was, was a martyr. And there was an argument over religion. One guy, one guy believed in a substitutionary uh, um, um, sacrifice, and the other one didn't. Cain thought it was his works. And that divides mankind in two, Cain or Abel. Do you believe in the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, or do you think you've got to be a good person, basically, and try and do the Ten Commandments? That's Cain's religion. It's grace, undeserved favor from God. Your part is to believe it. God gave himself. What more could he give? He gave his other self. The heir of all things plunged himself into poverty. And so he says, I want you to know what you really can't fully know. It passes knowledge. Listen, doctrine is vital for your well-being, that you shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Jesus told the the Samaritan, you know, he said, look, you you know, you got to worship God in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth, doctrine, truth, revelatory truth is the tongues. Listen carefully. Spurgeon said this. I like this. Is the tongues of the altar upon which Jesus Christ is the smoking sacrifice. Jesus Christ is held out before us, placed on the sacrifice, official altar. The blood runs over the stones, and truth is the tongues taking Christ and applying them to our souls. It's quite a picture. So Paul is saying, not just know intellectually, but experientially, intimately, the love of God. Listen, you want to know a sport? Play a sport. How many of you learned how to play basketball by reading a book on basketball? I'd love to see the the first time. Nothing can make you look more uncoordinated than trying to dribble a basketball for the first time. You, you really you should never do it in public, you know, <laughs> do it in a garage somewhere or whatever, but, but you just have to do it. And you have to know, you have to experience God's love. You need a history with God of observing his love, of tasting his love, of experiencing it through one another. And God gives us community to do that in because God is a family, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He reflects himself in a family, you know, Larry, Bo, and Curly. That's what he does. George Whitfield said this about knowing the love of God. He says, he was asked how he knew so much about God's love. And he said, 
When I was preaching, this is how I knew God's love best. When I was preaching and people threw dead cats at me. When I was preaching and people threw dead cats and then he added filth, which I, you know, you can fill that in. Isn't that amazing? Man doesn't think like this. Man doesn't think like this. And so God has to fully prepare us to experience the greatest emotion in the universe. We live in fragile bodies and fragile minds, you see, and, and uh, we grasp all this again. It, re it requires interaction with people. And as he goes on, he gives this doxology. He says, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us and so forth. And so he just bursts into praise, bursts into adoration. And adoration, by the way, is the eloquent silence of the soul that is too full for language. Adoration is the eloquent silence of the soul that is too full for language. That's true, you come here and how can you describe what you're feeling when you break out in tears at a song? How can you fully verbalize that? To lose yourself in God. And what are we called to adore here about God? He says, unto him is able to exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all we ask or think. We are here adoring in this chapter that God can do far above anything we can even think of for us. Let that be your coffee this week. Sip it. Nurture it, nurse it, take it in. God can do way beyond. God wants to do way beyond more than you ask or think. And he's waiting for you to press the envelope. I'm not talking about name and claim it, prosperity teeth. I'm not talking about it all, positive confession. No, no, a million times no. I'm talking about grabbing the truths of God in scripture and saying, I know you want to bless me. That might even be the loss of a job, to be honest with you. Might be loss of health. Whatever it is, the point is, you're putting yourself in God's hands. Don't take control of your life. You've got a fool driving the car. Don't do it. You're going to run into something. Think of the great things you've already asked God for. How did you become a Christian? You believed, right? What's one of the first things that came out of your mouth? forgive me. You know how the impossible it is to be forgiven for killing the Son of God? You know how impossible that request was? And not only did God answer that prayer, but he over answered it. He not only said, I forgive you, but I'm going to make you my child. And I'm going to glorify myself through your life, take you to heaven, put you on a throne, and you and I are going to co-reign over the universe. God always, God never means less than he says, but he always means more than he says. God never says, means less than he says, but he always means more than he says. So when he says, I want to bless you, you don't even begin to understand what that means. And that's what he wants to do. Be filled with thoughts of what God wants to do with you. Don't cut him short. You already have all of God in you restraining himself from overwhelming you, you see? And when you groan from heaven, you're betraying that latent presence of God and you omnipotence rushes through you on your behalf to him be the glory of God in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and you'll find that every biblical doxology has a phrase or two in them to sum up the reason for the doxology Jude now unto him who is able to keep us from falling etc and keep us before his throne and all this stuff you know and then blah 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 goes on and on but what he's saying there the doxology is is God keeps me he keeps me persevering. He keeps me coming to church. He keeps me reading the Bible. He keeps me believing. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 1, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory forever and ever. God reigns supreme. What, do you, what is the cause for the doxology? That God is king, that God is sovereign, that God can overrule anything that can destroy your life, including your selfishness. And so he says this, and this is where we'll wrap it up. I therefore, chapter 4, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling 
with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father above all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led men captive and he gave gifts to men. Now, we'll stop there. That's all our reading. But this is what all of this was leading up to. Remember, this is a letter. Letters don't have chapters, but the chapter breaks are put in there for us to understand. Therefore, see what it's there for. So what he's saying is this. Everything I've said up to now, this is the reason. So that you mature. So that you become more like Christ. It's instruction. That unity is manifested in love. And it's destroyed by pride and ambition. And it's kept by the Holy Spirit. He's saying, therefore, mature. Know these things and mature. Act this out in reality. We've been called by God to walk worthy of this calling. And divisiveness is, is the epitome of pride and immaturity. Remember the story of Solomon? It was one of the first tests that he had. Two women came and had one baby. The one claimed it was her baby. The other claimed it was her baby. And Solomon, in his wisdom, supernatural wisdom, said, okay, let me split the baby in two, and I'll give each one a half. And the one, the one mother, false mother, was, was fine with that. The true mother said, don't do that. The false mother didn't care about the baby. And people who split churches are willing to split churches. They're willing to divide churches because they didn't give birth to that baby. They didn't feed that baby. That, that baby wasn't part of their heart and soul and sacrifice. And what I'm saying here is mature. It ain't about you. It ain't about me. It's about God, and he bled for me, and he bled for you. And this is a holy thing here. God has purchased each soul with his very life blood, and anybody that puts their personal feelings or their personal ambitions above that is acting very immaturely. God says, strive. God united this. Don't you dare tear it apart. And so we've all been called to contribute to the well-being of other people, to add value to the community. It's the siren song of everyone in here to partner with God, to do something amazing in this world that will last forever. And then he gives the picture in verse 10 of the hero returning to the city and distributing gifts for what reason? To mature us for the glory of God. Quite a flow of thought here from the Apostle Paul. And how often do you hear, remember spirit and truth? Sometimes truth hurts. But the spiritual truth hurts what has to be hurt. And how many times do you see in the Bible God saying to some prophet or somebody, don't be afraid. He said it to the shepherds, said it to, to Mary, said it to Zechariah. He said, don't be afraid. This is a good thing. This is of God. I know it doesn't make sense. A child that's being born immaculate, you know, uh, the immaculate birth, you know, the, uh, you know, Zacharias, you know, you're, you know, Daniel, this, they're always falling on their face and fainting. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This is from God. This is a good thing. And so even though we have the life of the Trinity in us, we can live very immaturely. But he says this, and you'll see this later on as you read, until we as one, all of us here as one, corporately, as a culture, as a community, come into the fullness of maturity of the man, the one man, Jesus Christ. We're his body. And we're to mature into an accurate reflection of that beautiful head, our king, our sovereign, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's have the worship team come up here. Father, we bow our knees to heaven. We pray that we live for your glory. We lay our lives on the altar and use us, Lord, as you see fit. Help us to grow in humility and wisdom and love and patience 
And that is our glory. That is our crown. Lord, we love you. And the ushers are going to come down. They're going to take up an offering. And listen, folks, in the Old Testament, God said, listen, I'm giving you $10. All I require from you is one. And that was the bare minimum. As we went on in the, the Old Testament and we go into the New Testament, it's, it, God is saying, hey, if you get it, you're going to give more liberally than that. If you want to be selfish with what I give you, it's going to affect a lot of things in your life. Consider that when the ushers come around. And we're going to sing two songs, and as during the first song, uh, you can come down if you have prayer of any uh, need. Bob's there to pray with you. And um, uh, if you don't leave here, honestly, uh, unless you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, please open your soul to Him. Open your soul to God. It is the greatest thing in the world. It is the one necessary thing in life. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? What's the point? We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Now we worship you in song and in giving. Amen.